Guys. I am, I am very happy that we have these three gentlemen here. As you can see, I have next to me Mr. Robert Kennedy Jr. Kennedy24 is the website. Kennedy24, if you want to, please have a seat. Next to him is Dr. Michael Rechtenwald. Yeah. Wrecktheregime.com also. And lastly, Michael Termot at MikeTermot.com. Yes, please. Have a seat, gentlemen, please, have a seat. Why are we here this evening? We are here this evening to talk about one of the most important things that's happening right now in America. And if you look at the two political parties, the legacy parties right now, you will see something. Democrats are supposed to be about civil liberties. They're not. Republicans are supposed to be about less spending and less taxation. They're not. But why aren't they? Why do they not even believe in the lies they tell? Right, why? Because no one holds them accountable. All that matters is other guy bad. That's it. I'm not as bad as the other guy. I know he killed one guy, but I, you know, I, I only wounded him, so I'm better than him. And that's where we are right now. What can break that? What can break the legacy parties is independent parties. That's what we can do. You should be clapping now. Yes. And these three people here are running non-legacy. I'm going to talk about how we can fight not just the legacy parties, but also the legacy media. And third, and the hardest one, is the legacy voters and how they think and why they don't make a step, why they don't want to make a change. So I want to ask the first question, if I could. And that question will start with Mr. Kennedy, if I could do so. How do we handle the way the mainstream media ignores and disrespects us. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, I, I would say the answer to that is that the mainstream media is less important now than it has ever been in history. Uh, CNN's total viewership is, I think, around $400,000, uh, 400,000 people on the evening uh, and during prime time. Uh, Tucker Carlson is getting 40 million viewers. Uh, Joe Rogan is getting 10 million per episode. And I think one of the, re the, one of the reasons that I'm doing well, I'm, I'm now beating President Trump and President Biden among young people, people under 35 nationwide. The, the last poll that was taken on that issue shows me beating them uh, under, both of them under, uh, with people under 45 in the six battleground states. And I'm also winning among, beating both of them among independents. And independents this time around are the biggest political party. So it's 52% of the vote are independent. I think about 24 and 24 uh, Republicans and, and Democrats. It's the, first, uh, it's the first election in American history where independents have been the biggest cohort. And I think the reason I'm doing well with those cohorts is that they're getting their news from non-traditional sources. So they're getting it from podcasts. The one group that I'm doing poorly with is uh, the people I should be doing best with, which is baby boomers. And, and it's because baby boomers uh, get their news from MSNBC, CNN, ABC, NBC, CBS, The Washington Post, The New York Times. And if I was living in that information ecosystem, I'd have a very low opinion of myself too. Uh, uh, those, uh, those, uh, I'm not allowed to do interviews on those, you know, uh, I'm not allowed to do live interviews for the last 10 years on any of those platforms. So they'll report about me, but they will do, they've occasionally done live to tape, but they can then edit that and cherry pick it and then put it in their own context. So, so let me step in for a second. So if I hear what you're saying, you're saying that they're not even that important is what I, you're saying. I, I don't think they're important. And I think, you know, I have to figure out how to reach those other people in order, those baby boomers in order to win. And there's other ways that we can reach them, which we're doing now. But I, I just tell you this and then, you know, let other people talk. 
I have a 28 year old son, uh, Connor, who's very, very well informed. And he, I asked him the other day when I was thinking about this issue, I said, I said to him, have you ever seen an evening news show? And he said, no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Absolutely. and I think that goes for that generation. It is just not a place where they get their news. So there's a, an aging group that is getting their news from mainstream media. But, uh, <clears throat> I think you're right. Let me move to Dr. Rechtenwald if I could. Dr. Rechtenwald, tell me, answer that same question. How do we handle that? They, they ignore us or they disrespect us to the point that Mr. Kennedy is saying they will only do something that's taped so they can cut and paste. How do we handle that? Well, I'm, I've been cited by Mr. Kennedy's Children's Health Network many times, the defender, and for that I, I appreciate that, and I've been on Tucker Carlson three times and many other alternative media uh, sites. But I should say, if the day ever comes that the mainstream media begins to respect us, then we'll know we've taken a wrong turn. <laughs> okay. Okay. The mainstream media, let's be real, is a propaganda arm of the state and the ruling class. They're professional propagandists and liars. Now, the media serve up official state narratives that bolster the causes of the regime, as they do with all the wars, with the COVID, with everything else. Uh, frankly, I don't want their respect. Uh, I hope they don't approve of me. And uh, of course, they're going to smear all true dissidents. Uh, there's no question that all dissidents will be uh, smeared, or they'll utterly black them out. But that's their job. Uh, they, I expect nothing less. And so uh, they, they also cultivate controlled opposition purposefully. But, but hold on now. But we do know that a lot of people who vote do still watch them, right? We know that's true. So are you also agreeing with Mr. Kennedy and saying, you know what, I don't care, they're not that important? I think they're not nearly as important as they had been in, uh, in previous years and previous uh, election cycles. We have a huge media scape of podcasters and mm -hmm. X spaces and all kinds of other venues to reach people. But the mainstream media still matters because they are, in some cases, considered you know, the uh, papers of record in their various domains. We, we, we will be smeared by them, and that's the way it goes. Uh, we just have to get our message out more broadly to other, through other venues. So let me ask you, Mr. Chairman, it seems like the, you know, two of the people on this, on this stage kind of think like it's not that important. Are you in the same boat as them, or do you disagree? How do we handle the disrespect and ignoring? It's obviously not nearly as important as, as it used to be, right? It is not completely without its significance, and, and the reason for that is, as you pointed out, for a lot of folks, uh, CNN, the Foxes of the world, they are in some sense uh, media of record. And in that sense, it is not our job to try to please them, right? It is not our job to try to suck up to them to find common ground with their interests or their anointed politicians. It's not our job to see if we can say the right thing to get on their channels. It's our job to see if we can make their heads explode. It's our jobs to see if we can get a little bit of attention in a negative sense. Uh, I really liked uh, what Michael just said here. If we get their respect, we know that we have made a, a significant uh, wrong turn. Look, uh, they are not as important as they used to be, and that is worth bearing in mind. We're going to have to let them go. For those of you in the room with a little bit of gray hair that might miss these organizations, sorry about that, but it is time to, it is time to let them go. There is a little bit of hard work that exists today that didn't exist a generation ago. A generation ago, you'd be able to hit two or three media outlets and, and you were doing a good job, right? Over the past 18 months, I've had to do over 100 podcasts. That's a, that's a little bit of work, right? And I'm not suggesting it isn't a great pleasure to last week you know, uh, shoot the, the BS with Kim Iverson for an hour. But the truth is that you have to get out there and reach a number of outlets because the media is splintered in a way that it didn't used to be. That means once in a while you're going to make a head explode, and once in a while you're going to find an ally. So let me go back to you, Mr. Kennedy. If you're saying that they will sometimes take you on, and they will sometimes cut and paste and kind of put you in the light that they want to put you in, does that mean we should avoid them? In other words, am I so worried that if I go on to Fox or CNN or MSNBC, if they're going to make me look bad by the cut and the paste, should I avoid them? Or should we still go there and say, who cares? We'll take it. You know, any press is good press. Well, I, you know, my practice is to talk to anybody who will talk to me. If I, there's sometimes where I'll say, 
uh, I'm only going to talk if you if you put me on live. Mm -hmm. Um, but normally, I, I, you know, I'm going to talk to anybody, and I've always done that for many, many years. I was the only environmentalist who would go on Fox. I had this weird relationship with Roger Ailes, who was the founder of Fox, but when I was 19 years old, I spent three months in a tent with Roger in East Africa, and I had this weird relationship afterwards forever. Uh, because we were like diametrically opposed on every issue, but uh, I had great affection for him and he felt the same way about me and he was a very, very loyal friend. So he would get all the Fox News hosts to let me on even when they didn't want to. So I was on Hannity all the time. I was on Neil Cavuto. I was on Bill O'Reilly. And a lot of environmentalists would say to me, why are you going on? It's just legitimizing them. And I said, because I want to talk to their audience. I don't care you know, who they are. I want to talk to everybody. And um, I think that's the best approach. I think we live in a democracy. Um, the whole point of a democracy, democracy is an inefficient system. And the framers knew that. They knew that totalitarianism was much more efficient if there's a lot of waste and spoilage that goes on a democracy to achieve a wasted energy. Um, but the advantage that we have over totalitarian systems is that we have free speech. And so ideas, policies are, get annealed in the furnace of debate and then rise up in the marketplace of ideas and become policy. And that is the one advantage we have over totalitarian systems. And if we stop talking to each other, it's just going to polarize our country and divide us. So let me move to Dr. Rechtenwald for good. Dr. Rechtenwald, I, 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 what he's saying to me is that we should still go there anyway, and maybe getting the respect is a good thing. I feel like what you're saying is if they start to say, hey, Dr. Reck, you're the right guy, let me give you some attention, you're kind of like saying maybe no. Am I reading you right or am I reading you wrong? Well, I mean, when the New York Times went to the Mises Institute to talk to Lou Rockwell, he said, get out of here, you regime puppets. I don't want nothing to do with you. But I'm not, I mean, I'm not Lou Rockwell and I'm, he wasn't running for office. So I'll talk to anybody. <laughs> uh, I'll talk to anybody that'll listen and I'll tell them the unvarnished truth in all cases. And I will utter the freedom philosophy with every breath that I make. And that's the key here. We need to make sure we're telling the unvarnished truth in all cases. I noticed I talked There we go, okay, yes, you can go, go, ahead, go, ahead. Ahead. go ahead, go ahead, <laughs> I like truth, it's good. When I talked to Fox, uh, no, I'm sorry, Forbes Breaking News recently, I noticed when I got onto the topic of the war in Israel, they didn't want to hear about it. But I wasn't going to relent because of that, and I will not relent. That has to be dr addressed. No exceptions. Always, all interventionism we must oppose in all cases, period. So, so let me go on to you, Mr. Tremont. You're saying heads explode. Well, if heads are exploding, they might not want to talk to you if the head's going to explode. I mean, are we still on board or no? Yeah, we're still on board. Uh, part of the reason that we want to be able to make uh, heads explode is to help define us. And we need to be defining our party and our philosophy and our campaigns in our own context, not in the context of other parties. This is a mistake that I believe that we have made as a party in the past, seeking common ground with Republican politicians or Democratic politicians. We need to be the party of a good story. There really is no such thing as a journalist out there worth his or her salt, even if they are controlled by one party or the other, even if they're controlled by some corporation distant or, or domestic that is not interested in a good story. We're going to be a good story. The reason we're going to be a good story is, number one, we're completely differentiated. We present a different choice. As Michael said, we need to present a completely principled choice. That's going to make us different because there is no such thing as another campaign in this race that's going to be as principled as a libertarian one. We are not going to be one of those campaigns that decides, well, in, in this theater we're pro-war, in that theater we're anti-war. We're not going to be... We're not going to be the campaign that decides the Federal Reserve does some things right and some things wrong. We're going to cleave a very hard edge against the other parties because we're going to be distinct. That's what's going to present a good story. The media likes a good story, and that's what we're going to be. All right, let me move on to the second, uh, to the second piece, if I could. This starts with uh, Dr. Rechtenwald. I know you've heard this a thousand times. 
but how do we handle this? How do we handle the, I can't vote for you, you're a wasted vote, or you're a spoiler, a vote for you is a vote for Trump, or a vote for you is a vote for Biden, or whatever is the thing. I know you hear it, how should we handle that argument? And this is with the legacy voters, right? How do we handle that? Well, as with everything else, I will tell them the truth. Their vote is already wasted. <laughs> okay. Does it really matter if we, who wins if we end up with Trump, Biden, or another regime-approved candidate, really? I will tell uh, voters that unless they vote for someone who espouses the freedom philosophy of private property rights, prosperity, and non-intervention, they're wasting their votes, period. The dominant players are nothing but statists who will expand the state scope and penetration of the federal and central government. Uh, they will uh, claim to oppose the military industrial complex but send arms to other countries. This cannot go on. So I would dissolve the Zionist lobbies. I would stand up to the Zionist lobbies or even make them register as foreign agents. Foreign agents? Wow. Okay. Whereas none of the other candidates will, will dissolve the intelligence agencies or uh, eradicate the security state or end the regulatory regime. So this is what I'm going to do, and that's Hold on, I, I get what you're saying. I'm just kind of curious, how does that stop the spoiler piece? I mean, I get what you're saying, but that's still, if, if I'm afraid that you're the spoiler, if I believe you're the wasted vote, how does that change my mind, right, as a voter? I'm the legacy voter, right? I've been voting Democrat or Republican for 20, 30 years. How does it stop that? Well, listen, it's not enough to just tell people what they want to hear. We need to tell them what they need to hear. Okay. And okay. what they need to hear is the truth, period. They're throwing away their votes as it is. What are they getting in return? They're getting $34 trillion worth of debt. They're getting okay. a completely runaway economy that's headed towards the drain. That's what they're getting in exchange for their vote. Okay. Look, yeah. Let me, let me move to Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy, you, I know you hear this. You hear, well, I can't vote for you, I like you, but I can't do it because a vote for you is a vote for Biden or a vote for you is a vote for Trump or whatever they're saying today. How do you handle that, that to a voter? Well, I would, uh, you know, I would agree with what was just said. That you know, I think 80% of the American public doesn't want to see President Trump or President Biden run again. Doesn't want to see this contest. So, if you're voting for them, you are you're already wasting your vote. You're throwing away a vote. And um, we, you know, aren't we all tired of voting for the the lesser of two evils? Mm -hmm. Don't we want to vote for somebody? Yeah. Um, um, somebody who you like, and uh, my, uh, my favorability ratings are now higher than President Trump or President Biden or any politician in this country. Mine are, you know, mine are 20 points ahead of, of, uh, you know, of the other candidates in terms of net favorability. Um, so, you know, the other thing I, I say to people is, number one, President Biden does not need my help to have to lose the election of President Trump. And I, you know, I intend to take votes from President Biden and President Trump. I intend to win the election. My, uh, my polling numbers are now in, in the battleground states are averaging 24 points. And that means, and all I have to do is get to 34. I'm, I'm gaining uh, votes by one point a month on average since August. All I have to do is get to 34 to win the election. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, that means I have to take about four and a half points from each of the, the candidates. And, uh, and I, I feel that that is uh, within my reach and that the American people should be able to have a chance to vote for somebody they actually, that is actually going to change the system. So your answer actually is that it's not a waste of vote because you can actually win. That's your answer. Exactly. Okay. Mr. Mott, how do you handle it? I mean, I know you're out there. I see you out there hustling. I see you doing the work. So I know you're doing the work and you've got to hear, Mike, I love you, but look, your vote for you is a vote for Biden or a vote for you is a vote for Trump or whatever they're going to say. Wasted vote. You hear it, right? A vote for me is a vote for freedom and a vote for libertarianism. The reason we need to encourage people to recognize that a vote for the legacy parties is a waste of their vote is because when you vote for a Republican, you're sending the signal that the Republican Party platform and, parenthetically, the Republican Party actions are okay with you. Is that really the signal that you want to send? 
because they assume that when you vote for them, you're in love with them. The same thing with the Democratic Party. So if you are in love with them, knock yourself out. You should vote for them. But the truth is, you're wasting your vote if you don't vote for your values. When you vote for your values and you support someone who's not a member of that duopoly, you force the other parties to take into consideration your principles, your positions, your values, where you want the nation to go. If you don't take advantage of the opportunity to send that signal, that signal don't get sent. That's what's so important about it. One of the things that I really enjoy about Mr. Kennedy being in the race is that now we're going to three choices, we're gonna be up to four choices. Mm -hmm. That gives people more choice in order to better align their own values and principles with the choices of the politicians that they support. The reason this is so important is because we don't want to be stuck in this position where, well, I need to either vote for a, a duopolist so that I can vote for a winner, or I need to vote for someone as a protest vote. Yes. No, we don't want either mm -hmm. one of those. We want you to vote for someone that you really are in love with, whose values do align with yours so that you can push the American political system in the right direction. Well, let me bring that up, though. Don't we also want, you know, the protest vote? Don't we also want the person who, in this personal experience, I remember back in 2000, I voted for Nader. And I couldn't tell you one of Nader's policies. I couldn't have told you any of them in 2020. I, I, I had no idea Wait. what his policy I knew he wasn't them. So I was like, that's my guy. In fact, I yep. thought that Nader replaced Perot. I thought they were the same party. That is how ignorant I was to politics. I just voted for, I voted for him. Don't we want that, too, though? Well, we want a protest vote, but we want it in the following way. We recognize that our philosophy, our principles, our solutions, right, are completely counter to the way that our government has been run for the past three generations. That's the type of protest that we want, not a blind protest. It's okay if people vote for us blindly as a protest. Uh, that's okay, mm -hmm. right? Kind of but that's not really that. what we're talking about. Yeah. What we're talking about is recognizing that our platform is a protest because it's in such stark contrast to the status quo. Dr. Rechtewald, do you want the protest vote or no? I mean, um, you, you're about principle, I know, but if someone's like, I don't know what Rex stands for, I have no idea, but I'm just, he's not one of them, I'm gonna vote for him. Is that okay or is that not good enough? I'm, I'm, not, gonna, I'm not gonna turn it down. Uh, <laughs> I would take whatever votes we can get, but I, this, let's talk about what we really need to be doing here. It's not just you know waiting till election day to get votes. We need to create more libertarians in, uh, at large, so that when it comes time for the election, we're not uh, we're not waiting for these protest votes at the last minute. We need to be operating far down uh, upstream from that. Uh, we need to be operating and creating uh, creating the culture that develops libertarians. Uh, out of uh, uh, ordinary people, because there is a real thirst and a hunger for the libertarian message, and that's what we need to get across. So let me go to, to Mr. Kennedy here. You, you know that there are a lot of people who are happy you're running because they know your name, you're not the other two, you're not the legacy party, and they're jumping on board, and they may or may not know your policies. Are you okay with people just going, hey, love the name, yes, or do you need to get people to understand what you're standing for? I mean, the, the odd thing about what the polling shows is that my strongest support is with young people, and those are people who don't really, are not that familiar with, okay. with my family. Um, they didn't, the people who are most familiar with Canada, Camelot, who lived through that era, and who uh, ought to support me because they also oh, all strongly support me. Whose phone is me. that? Please turn off all your phones. Yeah. So please turn off all your phones. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Uh, I better make sure my eyes are <laughs> yeah, we go. Yes. Embarrassing. yes, please, go ahead. <laughs> that, that was me calling you. <laughs> there we go, yes. Uh, that was good. Uh, I'm yeah, sorry, please, people, people who, you know, who you would think would vote me because they're familiar with Ken, they would live through Camelot, they have affection for my family, they, they, liked, they loved me, you know, when I was the environmental leader, on those groups I'm least popular with. And the groups that I'm doing best with are young people 
who, um, and also a lot of Trump voters, people who aren't particularly enamored with the Kennedy name. But you know what? What's wonderful for me is when we do rallies, and you know we're selling out virtually every venue that we go to. There's thousands of kids there, and they're coming in almost every day. People come up to me with tears in their eyes and say, "You know, you're the first person who's given me hope." And I, you know, in 2013, there was a poll taken of Americans under 35, and they were asked, "Are you proud of the United States of America?" 85% said yes. The same poll taken four months ago, 18% said yes. Wow. Oh, this is a generation that's completely lost hope in our country. And that's the generation that's coming to my speeches. Those are the kids who stop me every time I walk through a grocery store, through an airport, down a sidewalk, and they say how grateful they are that they had withdrawn from the political process, that they're in because there's somebody finally who's giving them hope for their generation, for their future, and for our country. And, you know, that is, for me, the most touching experience and the experience for me that's made all of the you know there's many challenges in a campaign for my family there's a it's a, there's a lot you know there it's a it's a it's a you know for all of these gentlemen they're they're you know they're all should be tremendously respected because this is a hardship on, on yes them. yes and, yes uh, and they're all yes standing up for something they believe in, which is really important in this country. But um, for me, all of that, you know, whatever sacrifice that I've made has been compensated a hundred times over by seeing these kids come up to me every single day in every venue. So I, I appreciate that. I, I see what you're doing. I want to move to the next question if I could so we can stick to time. I want to start this one with, with Mr. Uh, Termat. This is a hard one that we all deal with. Anyone who's running non-legacy party will deal with this issue. Um, we worry in separate states, we worry across the country. How in the world are we gonna handle, Mr. Tremont, this horribly rigged ballot access system? Is the ballot access system really rigged against us? I hadn't no, noticed I, that. No, I, I made that up, it's not true. Yeah, it's not true, Lars <laughs> Mabstead, thanks very much. Uh, the system is rigged against us. I, I view the ballot access issue as a, a part of an overall cycle, right? We are stuck in this vicious cycle of we need ballot access so we can get wins, we need wins so that we can get more attention, more media attention, more money. We need all of that to gain power so that we can affect the ballot access issue. We need to arrest that cycle and reverse the momentum, right, to make it a virtual cycle instead of a, a, a vicious cycle. That's not so easy. It's not even easy to describe, let alone make it happen, right? To make it happen, we need a party apparatus, like we do, that is serious about a long-term challenge. In this sense, uh, I would point to examples like uh, Ross Perot, who, yes, in 1992, did get uh, a little bit of uh, success, yep. right? But he it did. did not turn into a movement that sustained either uh, the development of a brand that could challenge the duopoly, it did not result in supporting down-ballot candidates that believed in what he believed in. It did not uh, result in ballot access, which was your specific question. Uh, that was, I didn't even know what party he was part of. Well, that's I a, thought Nader was him with the same party. You're right. It, exactly. And, and that's why I, I believe that you know, the way we're set up here uh, inside the Libertarian Party has a, a great deal more opportunity for success. And it's one of the reasons why it's such a responsibility running as the nominee, uh, as one of us will, running as uh, the nominee for the party, to correctly brand this party for the benefit of down-ballot candidates and for future candidates. Mr. Rechtenwald, Dr. Rechtenwald, I apologize. Dr. Rechtenwald, how, how do we handle it? This is a problem for us every year, it's particularly in presidential years, but every year we're fighting. Sometimes we're fighting the same state two, three, four times in a row. It's a problem. How do we, how do we handle that? Well, the, the only way the Libertarian Party is going to gain and maintain ballot access is by creating an army of Libertarians. Uh, libertarians who will knock on doors, who will get out, get signatures and gain trust and demonstrate proof of governance at the local level. I don't think, I want to make this perfectly clear, I don't think there's a top-down solution for this country. This is not the answer. We need to build power at the local level and invest power in the people there. 
Uh, it is not about a white knight riding into D.C. and fixing all our problems. That's not going to solve the problems for our country. Mr. Kennedy, you have a tougher spot and not tough spot, both. You don't have the same infrastructure that the Libertarian Party has, or even the Green Party has, but you have a huge chunk of volunteers. It's got a different issue for you. How do you handle this ballot access piece? Uh, I mean, I'm not worried about ballot access. We're going to have ballot access in every state. Uh, we're way ahead of our projections. We're getting three times the number of signatures we need almost everywhere we go. Um, in we projected that New Hampshire would take us a week to get 3,000 signatures. We got 5,000 in a single day. In Utah, uh, Utah, the state of Utah, or the party in Utah, put unconstitutional restrictions on our on the on the length of time that we were allowed to get ballot access, and we challenged that and won in court. But we still got all the signatures we needed in one week and in the middle of a snowstorm. So our signature uh, gatherers had to go out, tell pe ask people to take off their gloves, get them to sign legibly. Um, and we get, we're, we're getting a minimum of 60% cushion in every state. Uh, we, we got Hawaii today, and again, we get m many, many more, double or triple the number of signatures that we need, so I'm not worried about getting ballot access. We're gonna get it. And we have almost 100,000 volunteers right now on the street, and we, we're not gonna have any problem getting ballot access. Well, there we go, there we go. So let me go back to you, uh, Mr. Kennedy, for a question that I think is a, is a challenging one that we all deal with, but you've dealt with a lot of it yourself, but libertarians all the time. I remember when I was running for uh, governor in 2018, when I started to do well, all of a sudden, the two legacy parties started lying about me. Literally telling me I was a plant from the other side, I was anti this, anti that. They said me, libertarian, let me show up, I was anti-gun. That was actually a thing they actually said. So lots of lies. Lies come out all the time. It's happened to you also, Ms. Kennedy. How do you handle the, the, the lies that come from either media or consultants or operatives? How do you get around that? Do you mean personally, how do I handle it in terms of how do I internalize it or how do we handle it in a strategic Oh, I sense? like both of those. Let's do, ooh, you just gave me, I like them both. Let's do, I was thinking extra, but do internal, that's a great one. How do you handle it you, when you know someone, and I'll go one step further, it's happened to me personally. People who I thought were my friends, people who I thought supported me, literally lying about me because they're so scared I might make impact starting and, and getting behind people who are absolutely lying about. How do you handle that personally? Yes. We love you, Larry. We still love you. <laughs> yeah, but now you do. No, I'm kidding. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. I mean, I, I've had, since I started talking about vaccines in 2005, I've had pretty much a steady campaign of defamation against me. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, if they, People don't want to debate you, and so they defame you. And that's a way of silencing, you know, character assassination is a way, is a form of censorship, a, st a strategic form of censorship. And um, I, uh, but I don't, I feel like as, wrong, as long as I'm doing the right thing, that what other people say about me is not my business. I have to be strategic. But I, let me I'm push not, back a bit if I could. It's got it there. It has to bother you. You're still human. When someone who you thought was either your friend or your ally or in some way close to you is either not defending you from the lie or right, jumping on board, do you, do you dismiss that person uh, at the end of that I person? Don't, I don't. First of all, I, I try not to hold grudges or, mm, okay. or have resentments. I, you know, I think resentments are corrosive if you hold them, that they, it's like swallowing poison and hoping someone else will die. But everybody, everybody that I've ever admired in my lifetime, you know, people, historical figures, whether it's, you know, uh, uh, humble to Alexander the Great, to Charles Darwin, uh, to St. Francis of Assisi, all of them were, everybody who achieved something important started out with, went, th went through valleys of death in their careers mm -hmm. where they were despised and hated and turned on by their friends. Oh, if you're doing something worthwhile, that's just part of the cause. 
and the and the lower you go, the you know the, the more beneficial it is. You you have to look at that as a gift. You have to look at the betrayals or whatever as a gift and not hold on to them and say this is part of my journey. And the journey in order to be worthwhile has to be difficult. And all of us are on some kind of journey like that. And everybody in this room has made a decision to challenge the orthodoxies. And I'm sure everybody in this room has lost friendships, has lost respects, lost uh, uh, professional affiliations because of your ideas, because you do critical thinking. You're willing to question authority, you're willing to question orthodoxies. And we, so everybody here knows what I'm talking about. You yep. made a choice and Absolutely. that is important. That's important for the, you know, the way that we, that's, that's what we want to achieve in our lives. We so want to be able to- you know, Let me go to Dr. Rechtenwald if I could. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Rechtenwald, you have had this happen to you. Is that what he's talking about? You've, had, you've lost you know, some professional issues have affected you, personal issues have affected you. You've had this happen to you too. It's, it's gotta bother you, doesn't it? How do you handle that? Well, you know, I, um, I lost my publisher mm -hmm. uh, because of my stance on Israel. I lost uh, my fellowship at Hillsdale College because of my stance on Israel. Um, I, I practice, and I'm gonna be honest with everybody here, I will practice rigorous honesty, okay? I'm gonna tell you the truth. Period. I can tell you how we shouldn't handle the lies that come from the duopoly. We shouldn't handle it by repeating them. We cannot repeat the lies and the propaganda that they spit out. But that hold on. Is the but I, 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 I want to hold on. I, I, stop. Stop. You, you, you are going to be removed if you don't stop. Don't give a damn. Then get out now. Get out now. I will. Sergeant Wallace, get rid of him. I will. You need to come here and listen to Kennedy. We want to hear the other guys. Too. I am. Get out. Thank you. <clears throat> what I want to ask you about is tell me personally. Yeah, that, that was well. Good, good job. Um, <laughs> what I want you to do is tell me personally. This has affected you, right? Give me, give me yeah. personally. Personally, it hurts. Uh, I've uh, suffered consequences. And uh, I agree with Mr. Kennedy that uh, the taking stances that are unpopular is difficult and you you will lose things you yep. will be stripped of things and that's the way it goes but i have dealt with that valley that he was referring to and i've trudged, trudged through it and you get spiritual regeneration from that that's where it comes from you have to be honest and you have to face it and you have to deal with the truth at all times and uh, and that's not easy um so i'm saying that look I will continue to tell the truth in all cases. Let the chips fall where they may. Thank you. Great. Michael, how's it, how does it deal with you? I mean, you know you've seen it in the party. People have said things about you that aren't true. You've, people That's not you, true. I'm sorry. <laughs> Only I have said things about you that are not true, just me. Only I've lied about you, but other people I haven't. But how do you handle that when people who are supposed to be your allies, they, they sometimes aren't? Mr. Kennedy said something really important about uh, when those conflicts arise, you know, you need to view those as, as real opportunities. Uh, you're right, Larry, uh, but I gotta say, you don't have to wonder what it's like for people to, bad, to, to say bad things about you if you're a police officer on the road for 11 and a half years in Broward County, Florida. And I gotta okay. tell you, you don't have to wonder what it's like to have people lie about you if you're a registered libertarian the entire time. Yeah, I've lost friends and had bad moments with coworkers, but it is all worth it because in the end, these conflicts need to be something that we adopt as our bread and butter. These are opportunities, and I know that you've had lots of conflicts, uh, Michael, in, in your work life as well, and I know that you have viewed these as opportunities to set the record straight, to let people know how you feel. It's only when those, those conflicts come up that it is really the truest opportunity to make your point. Something else I believe uh, needs to be said. In, in the past, I, this is my own personal view, our party has not done a good enough job standing by our principles, even when people are trying to say negative things about us. I do believe that in past cycles, 
we have lost the opportunity for as much success as we could earn because we have not found the opportunity to cleave that very hard edge based on our principles, that very hard edge against Republicans and Democrats. Might as well warn each other right now, you better put your seatbelt on because when we're out there telling the truth about how we feel about our values, our principles, our solutions, and how we want to change the way the American government is run, there's going to be a lot of pushback. Hold on, Mike. I want to ask an important part here, and you tell me if I'm wrong here. I feel like you being a cop in this case may have given you some extra advantage, maybe? Maybe something, some things you've learned from having to deal with that? Is, 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 that, is that helpful or is it not? Or am I just making this up? No, 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 it's completely helpful in the sense that you learn that what you're doing is not because you're looking for, you know, gratification because of a lot of people think, you know, you're swell and a lot of people are going to say really nice things about you. Uh, it's sort of like being a libertarian. You don't become a libertarian because you're interested in making thousands and millions of friends and everyone's going to say really nice things about you. <laughs> that true. just doesn't happen. Now imagine if you become a police officer and a libertarian at the same time. That's a whole lot of mashugana. <laughs> you know, I'm lucky that my mother still speaks to me. So you, you do get used to it, but it reinforces the idea that you don't do these things for yourself. The reason we're libertarians is because we're interested in standing up for others. It's not about us, and I love these guys, and Larry, uh, but it's not about us. And it's, it's not, a, to be honest, and I know this is not going to hurt anyone's feelings because that is, after all, what we're discussing. It's not about you folks either. It's about people out there whom we call brothers and sisters. We said this earlier today. For no other reason than the fact that they are fellow Americans. People who are among those least able to stand up to the world's most oppressive criminal justice system, least able to afford the resources that are taken from them by the American government, least able to make ends meet when institutions like the Federal Reserve I undermine get, I, our ability. I, I, I want to move on back to what Dr. Thank Rector you. was talking about, if I could. Now, Dr. Rector, tell me now, you gave me the personal, now, what do you mean, how does the party then, how do we handle it, right? Not you specifically, your personal, but how do we handle this as this, this happening? How, how do we handle lies, right? How does, you, how does the campaign, how does the party handle the lies, not you personally? Well, the party handles lies by telling the truth. I mean, look, it isn't, uh, this isn't just about representation here and like how we come off and being strategic and coming off and having a nice image. Uh, this is, we're talking about vital matters here. Vital matters that are, deal, that are dealing a blow to people all over the world. It isn't just the United States that's affected or the citizens here that are affected by United States policy and our proxy wars and our, our, our Federal Reserve that's funding these endless wars and you name it. This isn't just about uh, our image. We need to be fearless truth tellers that absolutely cut through everything and get to the bottom of the matter. Okay, the state is a, is a parasite. Let's be real about this. It is robbing people. It is destroying lives. We're looking at a, 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 system, a situation in which we have people on the brink of, of complete destitution and people being murdered at, uh, using U.S. military aids and, and bombs. This has got to stop. We cannot allow this. We must stop it. That's the message we need to get out. It isn't enough to be nice guys. I'm sorry. So you're, so you're, saying, you're saying that even though they do the lies, we just keep telling the truth no matter what right through it. Am I Absolutely. giving you right? Absolutely. Okay. Just keep telling the truth, make okay. it better, make it more poignant, make it sharper, and make it stronger, and make it stick. Okay. Mr. Kennedy, I gotta ask you, how does your campaign handle it? You have, you've been slandered, your campaign's been slandered. How does your campaign handle it? Not you personally, but how does the campaign get around it? I, we just try to tell the truth. Dr. Rector, well, you were correct. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> you were correct, I love it. Let me, let me if I could, move to uh, our next question. Um, this is from the audience. And I will, uh, I can start, uh, I'll start with you, Mr. Tremont. The solution, to the two corrupt political parties is not three corrupt political parties. If you, if you became president, what would you do to work, I'm sorry, what would you do to weaken the power and influence of two centuries of partisan power? Mr. Mack, could you start that? Sure, uh, there's a couple of things that, uh, that you need to do. One is obviously lead the federal government to a position of 
having less power to itself. Part of the reason the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are so very corrupt is because they have so much power. It's the old saying about power corrupting absolutely. That's what happens. So one of the things that we need to do is just per se live out what it is our platform says that we're going to do in a regulatory sense, in a size and scope sense, and especially, as Michael just pointed out, in a foreign policy sense. We need to cut back the footprint of the federal government, both in terms of how much resources it takes, as well as the imposition that it provides on us in not standing up, uh, not only for our values, but for not standing up for our civil liberties. That's number one. Number two, we need to go after the ballot access issues, and we need to do mm, so explicitly, okay. in my view. I'm not certain that this is uh, the big political issue that we want to push now as a third party. But if we were in power, uh, absolutely, you got to pound that all day long. Good. I like it. All right. Um, Dr. Reckenwald, how do, how, how do we weaken the, the, the power, really, of, again, two centuries of these two parties? We do it by promoting decentralization. Uh, the central government is the issue. We need to weaken it. We need to get power away from it. And uh, I would be wary of any candidate that doesn't explicitly promote decentralization and local governance. The object here is self-governance, period. What that means is the state has to disappear. So self-governance is the key. Anybody that's aligned with the big central government, adding layers, tinkering with it, or whatever they're doing, is aligned against liberty. Liberty is our object. That's the key. Politics is just a game that they play to get there. But we're not playing games here. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. <laughs> Mr. Kennedy, how, how, do we, uh, how do we weaken it? How do we weaken this power? Uh, okay, but is the, is the question, how do we weaken federal government power? Or it how do we be. weaken the power it, of I the think, two political parties? I think Mr. Chamat was more talking about the, the system, right? He talking more about the system. I think Dr. Rectimo was talking more about the federal government in general, but I think both are, are the appropriate answer. The question is how do we weaken their, the two-party grip, right, the corruption that's on, that's happening right now in our country. We don't want to have a third corrupt party. So is it we've fixed the system? Is it we make the federal government weaker? Both are appropriate, whatever you think. Uh, I mean, I, you know, well, I don't think Fixing the federal government has anything to do with the parties. Okay. I mean, if the if the question is how do we break the hold of these two parties? Yes. Um, I think that's what we're all trying to do, which okay. is to try to give the public an alternative. And I think this election, uh, we have a better chance than almost any time in our history because, or whoever you know, whoever runs. We're going to run against the uh, two least uh, p popular political candidates in American history. So both of them would win the record as the least popular candidate in American history if he wasn't running against the other one. <laughs> and so there is opportunity, I think, here um, to, to break this hold. And I think more and more Americans are seeing how corrupt it is, uh, not, you know, because of what they've done to what they're doing to President Trump. I'm not a fan of President Trump's, but I also don't want to beat him by having him legally removed from the race when, you know, a good portion, maybe 40 or 50% of the American public wants to vote for him. That's what they do in banana republics. You know, they remove candidates from the race that they don't want to run against. I, I don't think it's right that the Democratic Party, which was supposed to be the, the exemplary uh, party of democracy around the world, and our country is supposed to be the exemplary democracy, I don't think it's good optics that the Democratic Party really didn't hold primaries this year. Mm -hmm. It canceled, you know, it canceled several of the primaries, including essentially canceled New Hampshire and Florida, and, and other states as well. So I, I get and where so, you're coming well, with. Yeah, but, and then, you know, the other part of your question is, how does a political party, if you challenge that, then do you then become part of that corrupt system? And I do think that that is a conundrum, because that, you know, George Washington, in his farewell address, 
had this very, very beautiful condemnation of partisan politics. And he said, if we get, if we develop, if people gravitate toward political parties, they will become corrupt. People, they will, they will subsume the patriotic impulse and replace it with a partisan impulse and an impulse of self-interest. And that's a danger to our country. And I think this election really has been a template for what Washington predicted would happen. Uh, and I do think, you know, it is, it's a conundrum in our system if it's not a parliamentary system, mm -hmm. which does not really have this problem like we do. I wanna, I wanna move to Dr. Ruckenwald. Dr. Ruckenwald, you had something you wanna say. Please, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I, I just have to make a, a point of significant difference with what Mr. Kennedy said okay. in his answer and that he said he doesn't think that the problem of the parties has anything to do with the federal government. I mean, the thing is, the state is a parasite on the people, and these parties are a parasite on the state. That's how they survive. That's, what, okay. that's how they live. They're actually deriving their power from the state. We must get, that's the problem right there. So they're riding the state and riding the people into the ground. That's what they're about. The state is, is their vehicle for being parasitic upon us. Uh, so so you're saying you ha we have to affect the federal government, and that we have to to get rid of the party system. The, the, basically, the, the, the thing about the federal government it is we need to we need to wean it to, to zero eventually. We need to get it, make it anemic. The point is not to build it up or to take over it, like to ride it like the other parties ride mm -hmm. it. So what we need to do is undo it. The, the, we can't ride the state. We okay. need to we need to actually. Just, you know, event, eventually abolish it. But in the meantime, that our goal is obviously abolition. But in the process, we must, you know, shrink it and find a way to make it anemic. We don't want to feed it. So these parties feed off of state power. We can't do that. Okay, Mr. Tremont, go ahead. Yeah, thanks very much. It is true that the power of the state is what's driving the corruption inside the Republican and the Democratic parties, but it's not merely a conundrum to say, uh, you know, how are we gonna, keep this from turning into uh, a third party that's just as corrupt as the others. The idea of a duopolistic system is inherently corrupt. We know that authoritarianism grows in a democracy when a politician stands up and leverages your fear to say, what you really have to fear is not the loss of your civil liberties, but that other idiot coming to power. That's how it works. Yes. It's how it works all over the world. Yes. It's how it works here. And that can only work in a two-party system. So the idea is that we have to not merely break these parties because their politicians are unpopular. I appreciate the fact that they are. That, that is absolutely true, but that's not enough. The fact is that they remain corrupt because it is a two-party system. We need to unrig the system and get ballot access for other parties so that in the long run, we have a multi-party system. I like it. All right, thank you. Go, please, go, yes. Yeah, let me add something here. And, and this may not be popular even amongst you, but the party is merely a vehicle. It is, is, it is not the end here. It is merely a means. Uh, the end is something else. What is it? It's liberty. Okay, so the, the real object is self-governance, not uh, riding the state and making it take, you know, making it uh, run roughshod over the public. Uh, the point is self-governance, and liberty is the object. So let me bring that up then. Do you want to say something, Ms. Kennedy? Well, I, you know, on reflection, I, I like what you said about, I, I think um, that if a, that a third, that it is, you know, the, the worst corruption probably comes from just having two parties. And that if it's a, if they're, you know, if the libertarians actually won an election, that it would probably make the other two parties less corrupt. Mm -hmm because you then would have comp real competition and they wouldn't be able to have two monopolies running it. So that, may, that makes sense to me. Th thank you. Um, let me move, since you said it perfectly, to this next question. And I'll start with Dr. Rechtenwald, if I could. What message do you take concerning the election of Javier Malay, president of Argentina? President of Argentina, do you have, do you, what message do you you, you, uh, well, yes. Do you it's have, amazing do, that you would ask that question because this was just on my mind at this minute. I knew that. I, I know you, brother. Of course. What I knew does that. the Javier Malay moment mean? 
Yes. What it means is, and Javier Malay ran as an anarcho-capitalist, okay? He ran as an anarchist. That's the message. And now he took as his metaphor a chainsaw. Mine's a wrecking ball. Mm. That's the, what I mean to take to the state, a wrecking ball. That's what we need to do. It isn't enough to just tinker with the federal government. The federal government needs to be a, smashed. So all of these things, he said, afuera, 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 and it's working. This is working in, in, uh, in Argentina, and it will work here. We can do this. Let's take it apart. There we go. Mr. Tremont, please. People are ready for this message. They're ready for this message in the United States. I think uh, a lot of you know that I got my feelings hurt earlier this year when, despite having lots and lots of videos out there that are getting a few thousand views at a pop, just by emulating this guy, Millet, we got a million and a half views in the first two weeks. I'm like, I'm putting out original stuff all the time. How come I'm not getting a million and a half views for my original stuff, right? Just making fun of, uh, and not making fun of, but emulating uh, Millet. He is, after all, uh, an Austrian economist delivering a cool, clear, crisp message. The message, I believe, the lesson to be learned is that he was not running against other politicians. He was running against the way things have been done in Argentina. Remember that Argentina okay. was the fifth most prosperous nation in the world 100 years ago on a per capita basis. That is a nation that has declined hard. People are sick of it. And I believe that increasingly, Americans are recognizing that we are also going in a bad direction. And we all hope that before we descend as far as Argentina has, that we eventually recognize that we need to go in a profoundly different direction. He did not water down his message. He ran based on principle, not based on, oh, that other guy is uh, you know, really unpopular, so this is my big chance. No, that's not what it was all about. It was about actually changing the way the government works in Argentina, and that's the attitude that we need to adopt here. There we go. All right. Mr. Kennedy, what message do you uh, take? I, I would this? agree with what's been said. I, you know, Mele had a populist message. He was running against corruption. He was running against cr crony capitalism. He was running against an entrenched oligarchy and that has dominated uh, uh, pol politics in, in Argentina for many generations in which uh, certain families dominate the, the, the country and trade the, the, the executive branch uh, back and forth with each other. And, uh, you know, he was representing common people. And I think it's heartening that, that he won. And I, I do like, uh, you know, I think his rhetoric, the, the clarity of his message is really inspiring and uh, and I love his energy. Uh, I think it's heartening for uh, our country that that kind of, you know, optimistic, idealistic populism can actually prevail in a, uh, you know, in a very entrenched system. Here we go. Dr. Rechtenwald, do you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, Millet was running not just as a populist, not just uh trying to get the popular will behind him or having the popular will behind him. He ran explicitly as an anti-statist. He said, and I quote, and I'm sorry if this offends anybody, I wipe my ass with the state. That's what he said. He did say that, it's true. And so this is, this is what we need to run on. This is not uh, a message of just you know, political headwinds. We're talking about a principled statement that he made all together, all the way down the line, based on the Austrian School of Economics and based on anti-statism all the way through. That's what he ran on, and that's why this is the message for today. This is, it's no longer, we don't have time for any, anything less right now. That's what we must aim at. There we go, all right. I wanna get one more question if I could in, um, and this is, someone obviously was uh, watching your uh, lunch uh, today, Mr. Kennedy, because the question is, what is the most durable and moral framework for managing the commons? And if so, how do we prevent corruption over time? Tough one, I know, but... Yeah, uh, um, I mean, what I think is that, you know, I would, uh, that um, when you're regulating 
the re and I, I was talking to Chris Rufo about this today, that there are, um, there are examples around the world where the commons has been protected successfully through privatization. Um, it's not, you know, there's a lot of uh, kind of bad side effects. In England, for example, many of the rivers are privatized, but you need to, uh, you, it denies access to those rivers to uh, to common people. So to, to fish in England in a salmon stream, you may have to pay $20,000 a day. In those, this country, you would, couldn't do that. Everybody has access to that stream. Um, there are fisheries that have been privatized, in, for example, off of Australia, marine fisheries, and have managed the fishery very, very well. I think probably the, 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 the way that, the most obvious way to do that is that you need a regulatory framework in the commons. You need to, a framework that allows uh, the use of the commons, allows even consumption of the commons. Uh, but make sure that it's in the interest of all the people. So you can dam a river, you can get a permit to dam a river, but you have to make a showing that it's going to benefit all of the people who were who were benefiting from that river. And that's how we do it today. We say, yeah, you can put pollution into the river, but you have to pay a price for it. Um, you know, the, most, uh, the, the, the best way to do it is through market forces that you pay for any cost you impose on the commons. But it, it's, uh, uh, it, 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 that, would, that would take a whole new regulatory framework. You know, right now we do it through a permit system. And unfortunately, the agencies that administer those permits are captured by the industries they're supposed to regulate. So they allow those companies to break the law all the time. That's what uh, you know. This Department of Environmental Conservation and EPA did with General Electric Company. They knew that it was illegal. You can't do it. You can't put toxic chemicals into a waterway, no matter what. And they let them do it because GE had political power. So okay. Let me grab Mr. Uh, Termot, if you would. Can you answer that question? Do you want me to repeat it, or do you, do you got it? No, I get the basic gist here. Okay. Look, the problem with the way that our nation and around the world uh, nations have managed economic uh, issues with regard to uh, in, in the environment, with regard to management of the commons, the problem is not that, oh, you know, once in a while we privatized something and didn't work out perfectly. No, I'm sorry. That's just a complete misreading of history. The problem is that we haven't privatized enough. The problem is that courts and private capitalistic markets have not been able to take over enough of these properties, enough of the commons, mm -hmm. and therefore created a method by which to internalize these costs. So for example, in, in uh, the example that's just cited, you know, somebody pollutes the river and they know that it's illegal and they go ahead and they do it anyway and it's very difficult to hold them accountable. Yeah, in the system that we have today, it's very difficult to hold them accountable because we don't have someone downstream with private property rights who gives a damn, who will bring that tort, who will bring that case to court. We need courts and markets to do their job. That means we need more privatization not less privatization. It is true that the system that we have today, if you just, you know, once in a while privatize a property here or there, or once in a while you, you know, resegregate something that is ostensibly uh, in the commons and you privatize it and you spin it off to a group of citizens, and then it doesn't work so well. That's right, because our system is not set up correctly to bring these cases through the court system and through negotiations in the private mm -hmm. market. Thank can you. I can I can I just ask a question about that? Good. Um, what you know? What, how how would you, for example, privatize the air, and uh, you know, which is a key part of the commons. And and then I would add another issue, which is that you know I'm a litigator. I've brought in, brought thousands and thousands, uh, over a thousand lawsuits. Oh, um, and they're very expensive and most people can't afford them, and most lawyers won't bring them unless there's a big return. If you're, if you're using a stream and you're washing your clothes in it, your cattle are drinking from it and, it, and pollution kills a couple of your cows, 
it's very, it's not, it, it, it's almost impossible in this country to bring a lawsuit that would pay the expenses of the court case um, and to, in order to justify minor injuries that, you know, I can't use that river anymore. I can't swim in it because there's pollution in it. Okay. I'll, I'll go someplace else to swim. And what is the damage for that? Is it a thousand dollars, is it two thousand? Let me it's see if I get a couple answers. That in court. Let me get some answers. Let me, let me first do what you're then I'll go to you, Dr. Reckwell. Well, but I think he was yeah. questioning. Well, he was questioning. But, but, but I, I'd like to hear about okay? the air first. How do you privatize it? Yeah, you okay? He, he wants to go first. Let, go ahead. Let it go. We'll, okay. Yep, no worries. I mean, Dr. Go ahead, please. I'm right here. Uh, with all due respect, this notion of the commons is a quaint but antiquated term. It comes out of the 18th century and the, uh, the enclosure laws and uh, in, in, in Great Britain. And it's not really what, that doesn't really pertain to the situation we have. What we have is state property or state controlled property, so called. That is not commons per se. Now, the best custodian of private, of property is the property owner, the rightful property owner. The state, and there is no commons, it's state property. The state fails miserably at protecting property, including on environmental issues. If you want to know the worst uh, environmental polluter in history, it was the Soviet Union where there was no private property. That's where you had the worst environmental record of all time, including the Chernobyl accident. So look, we don't need to have more protections of this. We need privatization. Who will best take care of property? People who own it. Who is the best custodian of your home? You. Uh, and so privatization. But, but, but who would own the Hudson River? Would you give it to all the, all the boats that use it, all the commercial boats, the recreational boats, the fishermen, the swimmers? Would each one, who would own it? You could have uh, joint stock companies that would own that and that would, of course, of course they would take money for uh, the use of it. And this would not be some sort of a, a wealth draining situation because if we had privatization, we're going to have so much more wealth than we have right now. It's so then you, you would have a board of directors of that company that controls who can use the Hudson and who can for every purpose? I mean, you're going to have private, you need to have privatization and such that you would have a joint stock company that would uh, give out use leases for that property, yes. So you would have a board of directors that could tell you, you know, we're not going to let you sail on the river. Um, they, would, they wouldn't do that because they're going to, that's how they would make money through these leases. It's not like they're going to sit there and protect it and not let anybody use it. Uh, that's not how it works. So once you have this uh, kind of... Presumably, they could block some people from access to the river. So people, you'd have to pay this company in order to catch yeah, I mean, a the, fish. We're, talk, we're talking a nominal, nominal fees, most likely. The thing I mean, is, right now, you don't have to pay anybody to fish in the Hudson. With all due respect, the regulatory capture that you refer to all the time, the problem is not these corporations, this boogeyman that it comes in and destroys... Uh, the public property and so forth, it is the receptacle for those people. That's the regulatory agencies themselves. That's where the capture comes from. If you get rid of them, you get rid of the capture. So it isn't like the state has done a great job in regulating property. In fact, it's done a miserable job. So why should we trust it to do it any further? As I said, in the Soviet Union, everything was state owned. Look what happened. It was so a you would, privatize, you would privatize the air? Now, the air is, hold on, air is hold on, a, that's me, a non-starter. Let, I mean, let that's, me move to Mr. Tomat if you want to say anything on this one. Dr. Yeah. Director, I want to give Tomat a spot if he wants. Do you want to say anything, Mr. Tomat? Yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, there are ways to privatize relatively large things. Uh, the air is a particular challenge. I'll give you that one. But uh, when it comes to things like uh, rivers, dams, big projects, you do not grant a monopoly. You uh, assign property rights and various uh, bits and pieces, and so you don't have you know, one single organization controlling access. It also needs to be said that uh, people at a local level do have a right to come together and bid 
in a, a way that brings people together, either in a stock corporation or partnerships, or however. Now, some people would call that a homeowners association, some people would call that an LLC, some people would call it a county, some people would call it Nebraska, some people would call it Exxon. There are different forms that, that can be created when Americans come together to acquire these relatively large assets, even though they're pieces of rivers, not, you know, it's not, you're not going to grant a monopoly over we are, the entirety we are of a As a matter time. of fact, the state is what creates monopolies, we, we, we are up against time, so I want to shift us, if we could now, to our 90-second closing statements, please. I want to shift now, if we could start with Mr. Kennedy, please, 90 seconds. Uh, um, well, thank you for having me. I'm, uh, uh, you know, my campaign is about redressing many of the issues that you're, uh, that the libertarians traditionally are concerned about, uh, ending the war machine, ending this corrupt merger of state and corporate power, protection uh, of freedom of speech, uh, of all the rights in our constitution, ending the chronic disease epidemic, which is an assault on all of us, and, um, and, uh, and restoring the moral authority of this country around the world. And I'm very, very happy to be here and honored to be on this stage with these two distinguished gentlemen. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Rechtenwald, 90 seconds, please. Well, Sorry, isn't Dr. this Rechtenwald. what liberty is all about? We had a chance to actually have a, a debate, a real debate in the realm of ideas, and that is, that is what we have to do. So uh, let's take it from there and expand our liberty from, uh, from, from here. Let's expand liberty as much as possible. Today, not tomorrow. And how do we do that? I argue that it's really about self-governance. We need to try to resume and Take self-governance as our main principle. That's what we want to do. We don't want to be governed. Uh, and we don't need to be governed. That's even more important. We don't need to be governed. We are not the, uh, the waifs of the state. We do not need to be uh, their little children that they would like to make us out to be. This infantilizing sense of the citizen uh, where the state lords over them in every respect. So it is time to to begin, at least begin, this process of vesting power in ourselves locally and throughout, across networks, uh, in localities, and across localities through networks. And that will be uh, undertaken by virtue of several things. Ten Local seconds. government, but also, I should say, using parallel currencies and resting power and eroding the power of the Fed's monopoly over And the Fed, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, Mr. Tremont, 90 seconds. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Larry. Thanks, Mr. Kennedy. Thank you, Michael. Uh, this was a lot of fun. We've had a, a number of different questions, I think with all the same answer. You know, we were talking about what happens when people lie about you, what happens when they disregard you, uh, how do you break the, the corrupt cycle, how do you gain ballot access, how do you change the way the politics works in the United States? And I think the answer, I think we all recognize that a lot of our answers were not only the same among the three of us, but they seem to start to feel like the same from one question to the next. The answer is that we need to, to run a campaign that's completely based on our principles as libertarians. That is naturally going to lead to a number of conflicts. There are a lot of people out there that don't want to hear it. And when we start to gain traction and success, oh boy, put your seatbelts on. They are really not going to hear it. When you run a platform based on principle, you have given up your opportunity to say, well, you know, I support an anti-war message, except in this conflict. I support a deregulation effort, except I, I, I need to knuckle under corporations in this particular realm. I don't like it when science Ten and the seconds. government are all mixed up together, except in this one circumstance. When you give that up, you're naturally going to get a lot of pushback, and that's our opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to say thank you to all three of you for an amazing conversation. Thank you all for watching. I really appreciate it. And thank you for your questions. Have a great night.
conversation with independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. from his battle to get on the ballot in more states, the accusations that he is a spoiler candidate, and what he would do about what he says is the crisis at the border. He has been there twice in recent months. So you're on three state ballots right now. How are you going to get on the others? I know you've started your own We the People party, and then there's a libertarian area where you could get on ballots in that way as well. What's the plan and how quickly will it happen? We're going to be announcing new states every week from now on. We're way ahead of our benchmarks. We will be on the ballot in 50 states and the District of Columbia. Um, we have, I, I think we have 80,000 volunteers now on the ground. We're finding it extraordinarily easy, actually, to, uh, to persuade people to sign, and, uh, and we're ahead of all of our expectations. What do you say to those who say you're just a spoiler? You were very critical of Ralph Nader back in 2000. You wrote a piece in The New York Times uh, criticizing him and saying that he was going to hurt the environment by handing the election to George W. Bush. So what do you say now to those who say that you're in the same position? I, I hope to be a spoiler for both President Trump and President Biden. I hope to take votes from each of them and win the election. So you don't consider yourself a spoiler? No, I'm not in here to, to, to do anything except to win. President Biden was in an ice cream shop, and he was asked about Gaza, and he said, while eating ice cream, oh, there's going to be a ceasefire by the weekend. No, not by the weekend, by right after the weekend. And it's not the first time that we've heard him take on serious foreign policy issues in that kind of light environment. We don't hear from him a lot in terms of laying out his thinking on some of these big foreign policy issues. What do you think about his candidacy at this point? I think he needs to come out of the White House and show Americans that he has the cognitive capacity to and the mental acuity to handle this job at probably the most challenging time now, at least in, in recent American history. We're facing issues that are existential. We're, we're involved in two wars. We have AI coming down, which is going to change everything, and there's enormous dangers in it. We need a—we uh, have an economic— crisis in this country where, you know, the middle class is disappearing. It's been torpedoed. Or 57 percent of Americans can't put their hands on $1,000 where an entire generation of kids cannot buy a home. This is a crisis. We need a president who is thinking about these things, who is articulating the solution for the American people. Do you not have confidence that he can, he can serve? I think he needs to show Americans that, that he, you know, a lot of these decisions are, are uh, the products of complex and nuanced thought, and those thoughts need to be articulated to the American people in a way that we all support him. And I do not think that that's happening now. Our children's lives are dependent on that 3 o'clock a.m. call, and we need to know that we have a president who can wake up in the middle of the night and who is on his feet and thinking about those things. And I, I don't, I'm not, I don't think, I think a lot of Americans have lost confidence in that. So you're saying you don't think he's actually in charge? You know what? I, on, I have a personal issue, which is my Secret Service protection. And I've known President Biden for 40 years, and he was a friend. Um, he, w with all of the issues about, you know, about him, he was somebody who, I thought at least, had a kind of fundamental decency. And the fact, I just don't believe that he would have personally made the decision to deny me for Secret Service protection. I think somebody else is making those decisions. You've been supportive of Israel's battle in Gaza. What about now? Would you be encouraging Israel to stop the bombing in Gaza, or do you support, as Bibi Netanyahu has called for this week, that they have to finish the job and eliminate Hamas? 
Well, you know, I think Israel, like every other nation, has a right to defend itself. I think we have to come down to the fact that Hamas has said we don't want to negotiate. We want only one thing, which is the annihilation of Israel, the extermination of Jews in this part of the world. So I think, you know, I'm not a fan of Bibi Netanyahu's. I, I don't think most Israelis are. I think he would be voted out, but I think most Israelis are overwhelmed. Israel is today unified. Because they feel embattled, they feel that this is an existential risk to them. I think it's a, you know, it's a complex issue and it's not easy, but we have to look at what is, how do you avoid civilian deaths over the long term, right. not just immediately. There's some discussion that Joe Biden, the president, could lose the vote in Michigan based on a stance that's very similar to the one that you just presented, um, because he could lose 200,000 Muslim voters in Michigan. Michigan's a state that you think you just put on the list of one you might be able to win. Is that going to hurt you there? I think, you know, we need to make that distinction that Hamas is, is not the friend of the Palestinian people. Hamas is the abuser of the Palestinian people, and we need to point to the to Hamas, you know, when we see civilian deaths happening, which are horrific, which are horrific and unacceptable, um, we need to understand that, you know, that Hamas is at fault. Let me ask you this. With regard to the border, there is a battle on Capitol Hill right now that conservatives, some, many conservatives believe that you should secure the border before you send another dollar to help Ukraine. Do you agree with that? I mean, I think the Ukraine war should be ended. And I think I, I wouldn't necessarily couple those issues, but I think the Ukraine war is a war of choice, um, that it's a war that's easily settled, mm -hmm. and that we should not be spending any more money in Ukraine. We need that money here. Do you believe that any person who has crossed the border and commits a crime should be deported from this country? Of course. Of course, they should be deported. And the major thing is to shut down the border, which we can do pretty much overnight. And that, you know, through a combination of policy of reinstating the Migratory Migrant Protection Act, which which requires people who are coming through with asylum claims that their case be adjudicated in Mexico, not the United States. Um, we should end the catch and release program and, and have a catch and return program at the border. And build a uh, wall? We need the wall. We need you need, we need a physical barrier as a wall in the urban areas and places where migrants can disappear very quickly. And then we need other infrastructure, including monitoring, uh, long-range cameras, lights, fences, and a lot of the other areas. You don't need to put a wall 2,200 miles from Brownsville, Texas, to San Diego, but you need monitoring systems. And we had those in place, and the Biden administration dismantled them. So a lot more there, and you can hear the entire discussion with the panel in East Palestine and also my one-on-one -on -one with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. on the Untold Story podcast. That's going to be available. Both of those will be available. A double podcast drop this Friday. I encourage you to listen to it at foxnewspodcasts.com. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else. All right, joining us now once again to talk about the border, maybe a little energy, a little Bitcoin, is independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, good to chat with you again. We appreciate you coming on. You recently visited the southern border as well. I think much less of a scripted sort of staged thing as we probably saw today. Well, what's the reality at the border? It's actually surreal, Brian. Uh, it's, you know, I watched... I've been down there twice. The first time I spent almost three days down there. And I watched between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. in the morning, 300 people just walk across the border, and the Border Patrol is relegated to processing them and then bringing them to the Yuma airport, putting them on planes to any destination they want in the United States. And if they can't pay for the flight, the Border Patrol pays for it and then re gets reimbursement from FEMA. There's 8 million people that have crossed illegally, but, but it's, it's all, you know, anointed by the, by the uh, federal policies right now. We've adopted this, uh, this catch and release program rather than the catch and return program. Mm -hmm. 
and we've abandoned and we've abandoned the Migrant Protection Act, which kept asylum seekers in Mexico while their asylum claims were being processed. Oh, it was it's infrastructure issues. There's a problem. There's problems with personnel, but the biggest problem is a policy problem that could be reversed by the Biden administration literally overnight. Talk, okay, talk to us more about this, because you are a lifelong Democrat. You're running as an independent, and that's why it's so important to get your view on this, okay? You also live in Southern California, so you see immigration, both legal and illegal, pretty much every day. Tell the, and, and you probably heard my, my sort of off-the-cuff reference coming into this piece, Robert, which is that the border bill, while it may be critically important for funding border operations going forward, tell our audience right now that it has nothing to do with what has happened, correct? It is a political sort of red herring. <laughs> yeah, you mean, what's, what's, I mean, I, listen, I've watched in New York City, I heard the report, you know, earlier on preceding my piece where, um, I forget what the reporter was saying, but she was your financial reporter, saying that the immigration has actually helped inflation in this country, but that ignores the actual direct impacts of this huge influx of Im immigrants on our, on our social service systems, on our social safety net, and on local economies. New York City is cutting police by 5%. They've cut the fire by 5%. They've cut sanitation and education by 5%. They have yeah. encampments for migrants on their playing field so the kids, you know, who could not play their sports during COVID now can't play their sports because there's migrants on the playing field. It's insane it's, uh, to try to make the argument that this is a good thing for our country. And by the way, we need to show compassion to immigrants and we need to have wider gates so that we can get Ill legal immigrants into this country to take those nine million jobs that the manufacturers need. But the illegal immigration, there's no way that you can make an argument for it. It is yeah, all right. So, we so, have the Mexican drug cartels running America's immigration policy. Who can say that that's a good thing? Well, that, that's why bad. I think there's not. And I talk to the immigrants. The immigrants aren't, you know, the people who are coming over have been exploited, extorted, robbed, raped. They come over here, they're exploited by, uns they can't work legally. They're, they're exploited by unscrupulous employers who are paying six or eight dollars an hour. And those employers, contractors in New York City, are competing against union shops. So they're lowering the, you know, the, the, uh, the returns to labor in our country, they are reducing, they are uh, lowering salaries in this country. There's no, you know, there's no question about that. Yeah. And that's why we're covering it on CNBC, Robert, is that it's, it's an economic story as well. You don't have to believe us, believe you, believe me, whatever. You can believe the mayor of New York, the mayor of Chicago, the mayor of Denver and other cities. They're the ones that have said that as well. I want to turn to some other topics while I have you here because uh, energy. All right. You are pro pausing natural gas exports. You are pro banning fracking. I I'm a little surprised by that, given obviously given your your extensive and admirable environmental record, because don't you worry that if we if we don't produce it, other countries like China, India, they're just going to use coal and burn nastier stuff. Well, my position on fracking is that fracking should have to internalize its own cause. I was in Demick, Pennsylvania. This week, there's a, you have a whole town that's been poisoned. That's getting, you know, the people in that town, literally every single person in that town needs to, to have, buy bottled water, and the companies aren't helping them with that. And the roads are being destroyed by these fracking uh, trucks that weigh 40 to 90,000 pounds. These are little rural roads. It has absolutely devastated that community, and the water is horrendously poisoned. So what I say is, it's not an outright ban on it, but let's make them pay, internalize their costs. You know, mm. they're, they're getting subsidized by pollution. I'm against the, the export, I'm against the export of liquefied natural gas because it's bad for manufacturing in this country. The same reason the steel industry here, all of the smokestack industries are against exports of our frac gas. We have, we do not have the kind of, uh, uh, long-term frack gas resources that the industry originally projected. The, the, the actual reserves are much, much lower. The wells are going dry very, very quickly. 
Uh, we need that frack gas here yeah. at home to give our industries an advantage in the international marketplace. Let's manufacture things with that, you know, that we can but, then export. Not to export the raw gas is only enriching the, the gas companies and it's hurting everybody but, in America. But, but Robert, if, if I'm the economic or environmental minister or the president of Germany right now and I'm listening to what you're saying and I've covered this extensively, I've been over there many times, I've talked to them, I've been on the ground, they're freaking out because they need our gas. Yeah, they're freaking out because uh, because we blew up the Nord Stream pipeline and we deindustrialized Germany. And that's a whole different issue. I mean, what are we doing in Ukraine? Let's make peace over there. Let's get Russian gas back into Europe so that we can reindustrialize Germany, reindustrialize Europe. But let's keep our gas at home and use it for manufacturing and, and re, you know, reindustrialize America. Let's rebuild our industrial base at home. That's the best way to do it with cheap frack gas that we can outcompete the world. You, you know, Germany, you know, is making a choice to boycott Russian gas. And, well, you know, still, and, still and, get, and, and Robert, guess they're, what? Still, they're still getting it via liquefied natural gas. We don't know who blew up the Nord Stream. I know a lot of people suspect the U.S. Uh, and that's what you think as well. Yeah, of course, of course we, hey, we just, oh, of course we blew up the Nord Stream pipeline, but listen, for us to liquefy the natural gas and put it on and send it over to Europe is causing, I think it now costs like uh, 10 or $12 uh, dollars per, per thousand. And for us to use it here, we can make it here and use that gas for a buck or two bucks per thousand cubic feet. And it gives our industry a huge advantage over the rest of the world. Why are we, we why are we allowing these companies to do the unpatriotic thing of exporting that gas to Europe and giving those industries advantage over homegrown American industry? Let's keep it here. You know, for many years, for, since 1975, the export of crude oil in mm -hmm. this from this country has been prohibited by law. And the reason we prohibit it is for that reason. We want to keep it here at home to give U.S. manufacturers an advantage in the international marketplace so we can build things, we can employ people, we can reindustrialize our economy. And this is the way that we need to do it. We should not be, these companies are imposing these enormous costs on local communities from which the gas is extracted. Like I saw, you know, there's people in Dimmick who have fire coming out of their faucets when they turn them on and their children are poisoned. We've, we've declared these areas national sacrifice zones. Mm -hmm. That sacrifice should pay off with more jobs in this country, not just enriching the shareholders of these gas companies and, and then rebuilding industry in Europe. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, uh, the, the energy, you know, well, there's a huge energy conference in Houston in a couple of weeks, Robert. Maybe you should pop in. We'll be there at CNBC as well. Very quickly, I want to end on, on Bitcoin and kind of a more fun note, a lot of serious stuff going on. Bitcoin, you, you said you, you spoke at a conference, you bought it, you bought some of it for your kids last year. Uh, you more than doubled your money if you're still holding. Are you still holding? I mean, I'm, let's just have a little fun here to end the segment. Yeah, I am. I, yeah, I am. I'm still holding. My kids are very, very happy about it. Yeah, where, what's Bitcoin's real role? There are members of Congress, both parties, I believe, that think it should be banned. Yeah, I mean, they, they want it banned because they're being paid by BlackRock and Morgan and all the big bank, globalist banker, banking monopolies that are making money on inflation and making money on by the Fed printing money. And it, But American people, the American middle class, is getting rolled and the off ramp from that you know from the the money printing machine is bitcoin uh, because it is hard currency and we need to make it transactionally available to the middle class we need to make sure that people who want to have, protect themselves against inflation can have this but also that they have transactional freedom that the government mm -hmm. is not, you know, able now to, to, to digitalize our currencies and like they did in, in Canada. Yeah. And when the truckers disobeyed, you know, when the truckers protested peacefully, their bank accounts were shut down. Well, you and they couldn't pay their mortgages. They couldn't pay for their children's education. The government could control their speech 
by controlling their transactional freedom. And, you know, transactional freedom is as important as yeah. freedom of speech. And you only get that from Bitcoin. We're not going to get that, you know, as long but, as the government controls our, our digitalized currency. It was the site of one of the worst environmental disasters in decades. East Palestine, Ohio, a town of the population of less than 5,000 people, where on February 3rd of last year, a Norfolk Southern train barreling through town as it does every nine minutes. This one was around 9 p.m. that night. A wheel bearing overheated, came off, derailing 53 train cars carrying vinyl chloride and other, other chemicals, spewing them into the air and the ground. And then three days later, officials made the determination that, ra that rather than risk an explosion, they were going to do a controlled burn, a decision that many residents believe was devastating to their health and their property. Shortly after that, they were told it's safe. You can head back home now. So we were on the ground yesterday in East Palestine, where I was joined by Robert F. Kennedy Jr., an environmental lawyer for more than 40 years. He is now an independent candidate for the presidency of the United States. He is also of counsel with a firm that represents some of the victims in this case, not the people that we spoke to there, um, but in this case, their cases against Norfolk Southern. We sat down with the residents, which include people from Pennsylvania. So we got a take from Ohio and Pennsylvania voters just a few miles away over the border. Watch this. Let me start with Lori and Wayne, who actually are joining us from Pennsylvania today, but you're just three and a half miles away, right? Yes, correct. that's correct, yes. What can you tell us? Well, when it happened, we were dumbfounded. We didn't know what was going on, but all we heard was sirens. We were all in bed. Fast forward, we started getting burning lips watery eyes, nauseated, and dry mouth, dry lips. Fast forward 18 weeks after the train was blown up, unnecessarily, I might add. That's been proven. Uh, I was diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. So July 10th of 2023, I had to have a double mastectomy. Since then, I've gone through four rounds of chemotherapy. Our daughter, who's 24 years old, she's asking us questions like, am I going to be allowed? Can I have children after this? We don't have the answers. We don't know. She's due to be tested as well uh, next month. She fears cancer. And she does, she does ask us, am I going to be OK? Am I going to? You know, am I going to be able to have children? Am I going to get cancer? We can't answer those questions for her because we don't know. I just want to play a, a sound bite. This is President Biden, who has uh, just visited recently about a year later. Let's listen to this. Let me be clear. While there are acts of God, this was an act of greed that was 100 percent preventable. Let me say it again an act of greed that was 100 percent preventable. We know multi-million dollar railroad companies transporting toxic chemicals have responsibility to do it safely. And again, Norfolk Southern failed. What's your reaction when you listen to that, Linda? Um, I, I honestly don't know. I, I really don't believe anything anybody says anymore. I don't think anyone is genuine. And, you know, Biden had gone on to say, as far as that sound clip, he, he went on to say that we're going to continue receiving the assistance that they've been providing all along. We're not getting assistance from local government, from county, from state, from federal. We're not getting anything. So you're, you, basically what he said is we're going to keep doing nothing. What do you say to that, Mr. Kennedy? I like President Biden's pledge that he's going to hold Norfolk Southern responsible. But this occurred because of a failure of government. Norfolk Southern was paying its executives 80 percent of their salary comes from reducing costs. That's where their bonuses come from. The company should be criminally charged for what it did to this community. It was an act of theft. It stole the property values. It stole the health. It stole the, the, the pursuit of happiness. 
from this, you know, this wonderful community. They stole our lives. Yeah, mm -hmm. they stole the lives of people. All of you were, were nodding your heads, but how does it impact how you look at this election? You know, uh, we have seen so many people that have come through this community over the last year, and um, many of them have been just self-serving. Um, they've used this as an opportunity for their own personal and professional growth and not anything um, genuine. We have seen a few. We have seen a few genuine folks come in that have wanted to help us. Um, but we're so tired of hearing they're going to make it right, that it's, we want specifics. You know, our human health, uh, it, it, it's not a red issue. It's not a blue issue. It's, no. This is an issue of human lives. Yes. You know, politics has no business in this, in this issue when it comes to children's lives. You know, and, and the thing that I say, kind of what Cheney was saying, boots on the ground, that's the problem, is they don't know what's going on in the ground on, at the federal level. You know, you have to be connected to the people. Let me ask you a question, Mr. Kennedy. If this happened and you were president, what would, what would you do? On, on day one, do you evacuate the, the town? Do you let people go back? What do you do? Well, the, 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 preliminarily, we need to unravel the corporate capture at DOT that allowed this to happen. And, you know, right now, you know, President Biden says that he's going to fix this problem and hold them responsible. Why isn't the attorney general investigating this and, and filing criminal charges? This is a crime, what happened here. This whole town is a crime scene. I mean, what I would love to see President Biden say is to come in and say, you know, this happened because of a failure of government. This happened because these agencies are captured, they're corrupt, and I'm not going to tolerate it anymore. And I'm going to, I'm going to expose the people and fire the people who are not doing the proper testing. I'm going to prosecute the people who are responsible at the outset. Instead of kind of a vague promise that we're going to take care of everybody. I want to thank all of you uh, for joining us today. I'm thank grateful you. for thank your you. time and sharing your stories here. Um, there's nothing like meeting people who have been through this firsthand uh, and helping all of us understand your story. So thank you. Yeah, they talked about the fact that they believe that the EPA is basically in bed with Norfolk Southern. So they do the tests and they say, oh, the test all came back fine. Uh, then they bring in their own independent testers who give them different information. So you can see why they are so frustrated. We asked Norfolk Southern for an update on how they're helping the residents of East Palestine. They told the story, quote, we have been on the ground in East Palestine and the surrounding communities since day one. We made a promise to make it right. We're keeping our promises. To date, the company has committed $104 million to the community, completed major remediation work, and is making progress on long-term health, water, and housing commitments, according to the company. Um, but you can actually hear the whole conversation, which I really encourage you to do. It is very compelling. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else. While most of the attention in the U.S. presidential elections will be focused on the Republican and Democratic parties, in the event of a close-run affair, the impact of independent candidates could be vital. And as mentioned in our debate, one name in the ring this time has a familiar ring to it. Kennedy, one of the most famous names in American politics. Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s father, Bobby, and his uncle, President John F. Kennedy, were both assassinated when he was a boy. But now RFK Jr. has quit the Democratic Party and announced he will run as an independent candidate for president. I caught up with him at a rally in the city of Raleigh in North Carolina. Mr. Kennedy, great to have you join us for this. Thanks for your time. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming all the way out it's here. It's a pleasure. Uh, I should explain, by the way, uh, at the beginning, just for those who uh, in, in our global audience, which is very wide, who may not have heard you speak, that you have an unusual condition uh, in terms of it, the way it makes your voice sound, uh, known as uh, spasmodic dysphonia. So if they're curious. That's yeah, I, I had a very, very strong voice till I was 42 years old. And then in 1996, I got a, uh, a, a neurological injury. So my voice, the, the strangeness that you hear in my voice is not actually coming from my vocal cords, but it's uh, my brain sending the wrong signals to my vocal cords. But anyway, it's, I, it's hard for people to listen to a lot. But I just wanted to explain. To it. All right. So 
Let's start by asking how your campaign is going at this stage. I mean, if you judge by my poll numbers, my campaign is going very well. The Gallup poll that came out shows me at, with the highest favorability rating of any other candidate. In fact, I'm 10 points behind, about 10 points in front of either uh, President Biden or President Trump. Um, and then the, uh, the recent polling by high gravitas polls, uh, like the Harvard Harris poll, New York Times Siena poll, shows me out polling President Biden and President Trump among all Americans under 45 years old and among independents, which is now the biggest voting group. Interestingly enough, you're also in the unfavorable ratings lowest, so you're actually really kicking it there too. Yeah, I'm, up, I'm above water. I don't know why that is, because literally I went, a reads, I went about a decade of my life when I was involved in vaccine safety advocacy with, with thousands of articles written about me and all of them negative. So I, to me, it's encouraging somehow that somehow my favorability has survived that. I'll get onto some of the issues that you're, you're standing for in a moment, but your strategy seems to be ballot access. That's to get you on every ballot across the country. And I'm wondering, you know, how challenging that's proving to be, especially as you're running as, a, as an independent. Well, we're just starting out that battle. I have to get each day we have 50 states in the, in the District of Columbia. And they all have different rules, and they're very arcane and Byzantine and, and uh, complex. So, uh, but I, in total, I have to get a million signatures. President Biden and President Trump will be on those, uh, all those ballots for free. Uh, but for me, I need to organize grassroots efforts to get those signatures. And we're doing that, you know, we're, and we're way ahead of, of where we uh, projected. Uh, so getting the signatures is turning out to be easier. I think in the long run, it's, pro it's paradoxically going to put me in a stronger position because it's forcing us to develop a very, very good ground game very early in the election. President Biden and President Trump are probably not going to really focus on their ground game till next August. And then they have two months to put it together. But I will be building our army. We already have 50,000 volunteers in the field and many, many more coming in every day. So how much of a disadvantage is it to you that you've never held political office? I know you've considered it a number of times, but especially as politics is one of those uh, areas in which those relationships that are built over long term uh, periods of time are important. Well, I had those relationships because my family name and access. I burned a lot of those relationships during the uh, COVID pandemic by going against the orthodoxies. Um, but in terms of the voters, uh, I think it's an advantage to not be, you know, the, the, uh, in, in most people's minds in this country, what's happening inside of the Beltway is, uh, is I, I, I'm, I'm not going to use the word corrupt, but is, uh, uh, is distasteful. So oh, I, I don't think I I don't think me not having had a long career in politics is going to help me. And I've been on the periphery of politics since the day I was born. It seems you've heavily courted though the right wing and libertarian media appearing on a lot of the shows and and podcasts of of those uh, key figures. And I wonder to what extent you're limiting yourself there. Then, well, that's not a strategic choice for me. I'll go on anybody who lets me go on. Oh, it's the, the liberal media, the CNN, MSNBC, will not let me appear in an interview. They'll do, occasionally, they'll do a taped interview with me, but they'll no, never do anything live. It's, you know, it's, politics is considered a dirty business, I think, all across the world. And your, your opponents will use every opportunity to target you, whether it's your views, as we'll get onto in, in a minute, more of your views. But also, for example, that you, you know, had drug addiction when you were younger. It went on for a few years. Uh, and, and were actually, uh, you know, arrested and convicted for that. How much are those kind of weapons against you going to be effective in, in, in limiting what you can achieve? Well, I don't think that particular, um, that, that particular episode in my life is going to end up hurting me because every American family, you know, I've been, uh, I, I got sober f uh, 40 years ago. And I'm very open about my sobriety, so it's not something that I, and about my addiction. 
the 14 years that I was a heroin addict. I talk about it openly. I think people, it's important for people to hear about that. I think it's important for people to hear stories of recovery. And my impression is that that's not, um, it's, you know, there's so many Americans have now been touched by addiction in our family. It's one of the largest causes of death. Last year, we lost 106,000 kids in our country from drug overdoses. That's double the number that we lost in the 20-year Vietnam War. Um, and I talk about the, you know, from, from being in recovery a long time, I, I understand the, the, um, the challenges and the difficulties, but also the opportunity to heal other Americans whose lives have been touched by this as well. So I'm very open about talking about that. And I don't get the impression that it uh, turns people, voters against me, but I don't know. I mean, my choice, I said at the beginning of this, when I announced eight months ago, I said, the entire population has been subject to a, a medical experiment for three years. And I'm now gonna do a mass experiment on the, on the American public, which is an experiment in truth telling. I'm gonna be honest with myself, honest about the problems in this country, honest about the challenges. And uh, if there's an appetite for that, I'll win. If there's no appetite, then I'll lose. And I'll, I'll, either way, I'll be okay. You're behind a, a, quite a diverse range of issues um, that draw from both camps, the, what the Republicans stand for, what the Democrats stand for. And I'm wondering that uh, as a result, it's possible that you might actually dent both sides, but then it also might make you more a facilitator for one or the other rather than a viable candidate for yourself. What, what are your worries about that? I, I don't worry about that. My, my intention is to win the election. Oh, you know, there's 60, I think 61% um, of the American public in the most recent poll does not want President Biden or President Trump as president. They don't want that contest. These are the two most unpopular candidates ever to run in America, the entire span of American history since polls started uh, to run as the candidate for a major political party, both of them. So, you know, I... Um, I think Americans deserve a choice, a, a, a more of a choice than just the lesser of two evils, that there should be other opportunities for them that they should have. They, you know, they're entitled to somebody who's gonna inspire them to make them believe in our country again. And I don't think they're getting that from the two political parties. If stuck with either of those, if it came to that, which would be the, the worst I, I, I don't have a plan B. I'm, I'm in, intending to win this election. <laughs> So let's look at some of the key issues you're highlighting as important for you in your campaign. The first being immigration. Um, what, what your camp often sees as a border crisis. Um, considering that the United States is a country of immigrants, I wonder how you, you know, that, that's such a main issue uh, and what you plan to do about it. Well, we ought to have, you know, America is a welcoming country. We ought to have wide gates, but also high walls. We need to, we can't be having seven million people come across the border um, without any regulation. Uh, you know, people wait in line and they make their applications and we, we need immigrants in this country. We, we've got a social security system that needs a new generation of workers in order to uh, keep it solvent. But we, we as a nation, like every other nation, need to be able to control our borders and control our immigration policies. So that, you know, that's, I think that's basic. That, that shouldn't be a radical idea. And, and, you know, I went down to the border. I watched, uh, we're now getting 14,000 people a day come across with, uh, you know, no plan. And it, it's unnecessary. I watched 300 people come across between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. at Yuma, Arizona. And the Border Patrol's job now has devolved into just simply driving them to the airport and putting them on a plane to any destination they want in the United States. The, the drug cartels manage the, the immigration policies, so they, they were coming in on buses that are owned by the Sinaloa cartel. And they're paying the cartel $10,000 a piece to get them to the border. And it's, a, it's an insane, insane policy. No country in the world would let that happen, and we shouldn't either. So what's the most viable solution, then? What could really be effective? Well, there, there are many things that we could be doing. We could shut it off overnight if we had political will. 
you need to end the catch and release program. You need to, we need to uh, have enough asylum court judges so that those cases are adjudicated before people step into our country. Once they step in, they have an asylum claim and they, they can stay here until it's uh, fully adjudicated. So you need to adjudicate it before they come across. And this kind of runaway immigration feeds on itself because everybody now in the world knows. I mean, the, the people who were coming across the night that I went there knew exactly what was going to happen to them because the drug cartels are advertising on TikTok and YouTube and telling them, here's exactly what's going to happen to you. You pay us the money, we'll pick you up at Mexico City Airport, we'll get you a local visa, we'll put you on a local plane to Mexicali, we'll pick you up in the parking lot at Mexicali and buses, we'll bring you to the border, you will be escorted across and brought to the Yuma Airport. And they're doing this up and down the border. And it, it, there's never been a migration like this. An illegal migration into an unwilling country ever in the history of human beings um, that we know of, of any state um, of this size. I have quite a bit to cover with you, so, so let me ask you about this. You say you want to end proxy wars, bombing campaigns, covert operations, coups, paramilitaries, and everything else that has become so normal that most people don't know what's happening. And you believe the, Demo the Democratic Party has become the party of war, blaming President Biden. I think both parties are the parties of war. So many argue the USA military machine has always been at the heart of this country's system and that it's not something you can overturn or change in an easy way. How would you do that? Uh, I will wind down the empire abroad. We have now 800 bases abroad, and each one of those is picking a fight with somebody. And, um, you know, the Russians have a one, one, maybe two bases. The Chinese have one or two bases abroad. Uh, we spend 10 times on our military. We spend more on our military than the next 10 nations combined. And we've spent $8 trillion on useless wars since 2001 and you know look what we've gotten for it the whole world is in chaos because of that i mean let, let me just go through what the costs of were of iraq we left iraq worse off than we found it we killed more iraqis than saddam hussein um iraq today is a a, a, a battle an incoherent nation with a battle between Shi and sunni death squads it has become a proxy for iran which is why all this other chaos is breaking out with the Houthis, because iraq once counterbalanced iran's power in the region it doesn't exist anymore we wiped that out we created isis we drove with the syrian spillover war we drove two million refugees into europe which destabilized all the democracies in europe for the next two or three generations. Brexit is probably a direct result of our intervention in Iraq, you know, in that way. And uh, what's happening in France now with the rioting, et cetera, is all traceable to our Iraq war. So that's what we got. And, and meanwhile, the American middle class is falling off a cliff. I was at my uncle's inauguration in 1961. Three days before he was inaugurated as president, John F. Kennedy, Dwight Eisenhower, the outgoing president, gave a speech, in which, the, which probably now should be regarded as the most important speech in American history, where he warned America against the emergence of a military industrial complex that would turn us into an imperium abroad and a national security state at home and put the weapons manufacturers in charge of American democracy. And today, that's exactly what has happened. And, you know, we are addicted this pipeline of new wars that are being driven. You look, who's, who's funding both the Democratic and Republican Party? It's Raytheon, General Dynamics, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, and Lockheed. And they need to put NATO in every country in Europe because then that new country has to uh, adopt NATO uh, weapons purchase specifications. And it's a guaranteed market for those countries. It's all a big money laundering project, uh, which, you know, we need to unleash ourselves from. So some might see some irony in the fact that you're anti-war and anti-interventionist, and yet you believe there should be no call for a ceasefire uh, in the Israel-Hamas situation, uh, ending the, the ongoing military campaign by Israel in Gaza. And that's being described by genocide uh, in some quarters. So how can you justify that? Well, it's not genocide. It's a, it's a war. And in fact, Israel does more to prevent civilian casualties than any country in human history. And if you look what they've done in Gaza, 
which is to warn people before they bomb. Nobody else does that. They've sent out 1.2 million pamphlets. They, they make they made 20,000 telephone, direct human to human telephone calls to people before they bomb apartment building. They, uh, they've sent out, they've, they've made 1.2 million robocalls to everybody who's about to get bombed. They do, uh, they send roof knocker bombs, which they invented to avoid, but they're fighting against an implacable foe, which is vowed to, for, to uh, committed to a genocide of Israel that does not want to negotiate, that has violated every ceasefire that they, that, that has, the five ceasefires before they violated every one of them. They, they have said we will not be content with any result other than a genocide of the Jews and the annihilation of Israel. How can you negotiate with that group? I don't, you know, I believe wars are, are wrong. And there, since in American history, the last uh, war that we fought that was justified was World War II. World War I was not. We should never have gotten into it. And none of the wars since World War II. But this, it, you know, Israel's not asking us for troops. They're asking us for support. And by the way, the support that we've given Israel is mainly to construct the Iron Dome, which is a, a, a mechanism for avoiding the invasion of Gaza. Because Gaza, Hamas has shot 30,000 rockets at Israel since 2006, at, at, at civilian populations in Israel. Even it's part of the propaganda war that, that Gaza has the densest population in the world. It doesn't. Tel Aviv has twice the population density as Gaza, and Gaza's been firing missiles at civilian populations for 30 years. What other country in the world would we ask to put up with that? And the Israelis do. Why? How do they do it? They built an iron dome but it's, it's, that but allows sorry, them. It's still a unique situation where you have the people in Gaza who don't have freedom of movement. Oh, but but why, do, why are you blaming the Israelis for that? No, it's, no, the, no. It's, the, it's Hamas that has given them no, no freedom of movement. Hamas has turned Gaza into an open air prison, not Israel. Israel didn't do that. The outcome, the outcome still that what we're seeing right now is tens well, of Well, of course, thousands. you know, the outcome in World War II when we invaded Germany and killed two million civilians in order to get Hitler. You know, Churchill didn't want to do that. Churchill wanted, Churchill and Roosevelt argued at Casablanca and Roosevelt said we need unconditional surrender because as long as the Nazis were there, it's going to be a war making machine and they'll grow up again. And uh, Churchill said, yeah, but if we make unconditional surrender, they're going to fight to the death and there's going to be a lot of civilians. Roosevelt said, over the long run, it's a better outcome for everybody. And indeed, that's what happened. We did the same thing in Japan, the same thing in Germany. We denazified them. Uh, Israel needs to de-radicalize Gaza, so that the money that we've poured into Gaza, Gaza's now... It's, it's going to be the opposite effect. If you've got generations now seeing what's been happening, the, the Palestinians... It's already... It, 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 that's not Israel's fault. That is the, the ideology that Gaza teaches children from when they're born, from the, when they're toddlers. But they're but taught still, that the, the highest aspiration of a Palestinian is to slit the throat of a Jew. But, you know, they're sorry, taught the that from when they're yeah. little babies. So, of course, you know, what we saw on October 7th, the level of brutality, an entire group of people that had the morality of serial killers where they're cooking babies in ovens. I, I, so I don't think any, you cannot get yeah. worse than that. I that only comes from indoctrinating children from when they're little I babies. I don't think anyone's questioning that. Uh, what I'm getting at, though, is that Essentially, the, the Palestinians have to go through border checkpoints. They have a different situation. So it's their own country. And, and listen, God, they had an open border in Gaza until Hamas took over. Hamas had suicide bo bo bombers across the border. What, do you, what would you think would happen, Mr. Khan, if, um, if Mexico sent 30,000, said, you know, we elected a government that said, we're going to uh, reclaim Texas? And they sent 30,000 rockets onto San Antonio. And they sent suicide bombers across so to I'm kill not, Americans. I'm, I'm, Would, do you think we'd put up a fence? I, I'm not defending Hamas, sir. That's not the, the question. I'm just yeah, I'm curious you, about but, your perspective. You're, you're blaming Israel. I'm not for, blaming anyone. I'm just questioning what your perspective is on this. Because, yeah. for example, you said, um, you know, Palestinians are the most pampered people in the world. I was just trying to get your perspective. All right, right. let me answer that. Please. 
I, I'm saying that because, not because Palestinians have a good life. I'm pro-Palestinian. I'm as pro-Palestinian as you can get. I'm anti-Hamas. Hamas has robbed the Palestinian people. The international aid community, well, the United States, after World War II, get, uh, created the Marshall Plan. And we rebuilt 17 nations in Europe that were destroyed by World War II. We gave an average payment of $48 per capita in, in 1948 dollars. It's about $621 per capita today. We have already funneled to the 5 million Palestinians an average of $8,600 per capita, more than 13 times what we did to recreate, uh, to, to rebuild all of Europe. What's happened to that money? The Palestinians are worse off and they started because that money is being stolen by Hamas, which is a organized crime cartel and a corporate kleptocracy. Ismail Nahania, who's the head of Hamas, has a net worth of $5 billion. The top three leaders of Hamas have a net worth of, of $11 billion collectively. Mahmoud Abbas has a billion dollars. His son has $750 million each. Yasser Arafat on a billion. So they're stealing the money, they're using that money, that international aid money, for two reasons. One, to build weapons, 300 miles, entire underground city, 300 miles of tunnels, to buy, to buy Kalashnikovs, to buy bombs, to buy drones, to kill Jews with. That's it. Hamas is the enemy of the people of Palestine and, and uh, not, you know, not Israel. If you were at the helm in the White House right now, how would you be handling the Israeli-Palestinian situation? What would you do? I would be on the phone. I, I would have a different relationship with, with the world leaders like Xi, like Putin, um, like Sisi in Egypt. I think this, that there is a chance for peace short of the complete annihilation of Hamas if all the other uh, world leaders and the world community came together to support Israel and said, we're going to help you solve this problem. But that's not what happened. Unfortunately, they left Israel on its own. And at that point, Israel doesn't have any, any options except to destroy Hamas. So, and, you know, I, I'm not a fan of Prime Minister Netanyahu. And most Israelis aren't either. Most Israelis no longer support him, but they do support this policy because there is no future for Israel if they don't destroy Hamas. In order to cover a number of issues with you, sirs, I know time is limited. Let me ask you about the Russia-Ukraine situation. You described the, uh, that invasion of Ukraine as a proxy war between Russia and the U.S. Give me yeah. your perspective. Well, it's a proxy war. I mean, the, the, the real fulcrum of the war is over the extension of NATO into, into Ukraine and the extension of NATO across all of Europe. We agreed in 1992 when Gorbachev moved his troops out of, Russian troops out of um, East Germany and allowed us to reunify East Germany under, uh, under, uh, under NATO. We agreed not to move NATO to the east. And since then, we've moved it into 14 countries. We put Aegis missile systems, which are nuclear capable in Poland and Romania, we could deliver nuclear payrolls loads to Moscow within 12 minutes, so we could decapitate the entire Soviet leadership in 12 minutes. We walked away from the two nuclear weapons treaty, the intermediate treaty that we had signed. We unilaterally walked away. Naturally, Putin has national security anxieties, the same ones that my uncle had when the Russians put Soviet missiles in Cuba. I'm not making excuses for Putin. Putin had other options, and, you know, Putin is who Putin is, and I'm not a supporter of Putin's. Uh, my uncle always said, you have to put your guy, your shoe, yourself in the other guy's shoes, and that has not happened here. Nobody, you know, our, our greatest diplomats, George Cannon, who was the architect of the containment policy during the Cold War, Bill Pierce, the head of the CIA, uh, Bill Perry, who was the uh, U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union, all said, we're going to resign if you move NATO into Ukraine because you're forcing the Russians into a violent response. Now, I'll just say this. The Russians two times have come to the negotiating table and worked out term sheets with, sheets with President Zelensky that they were ready to sign. And in both cases, the U.S., torpedoed those agreements, one in April of 2022, and the other was the Minsk Accords. And we forced Zelensky not to sign those agreements. I'm going to ask you, as we're running out of time, I'm going to ask you about the home front now, the U.S. Uh, view. 
in the USA, gun violence uh, obviously raises its ugly head uh, regularly. Um, that's, a, that's an issue you have to deal with. The, uh, uh, you're also divergent from the MAGA, the Make American America Great Again movement on that front and abortion, affirmative action. What, what is your, your perspective? How will you win over the voter base? That, that, that's very well, strong. I, I, I'm not going to talk about winning over the voter base. I'm talking about staying true to my principles. And I've fought for medical freedom for as, far, as hard as anybody in the world, I would say, that people ought to have autonomy over their own bodies, that a government shouldn't be telling people what to do. And I think every abortion is a tragedy. Nobody wants to have one, but the uh, choice should not be left for the government. We have to trust women. We have to trust the mothers on that issue. Uh, on the gun issue, we have a Second Amendment in this country. I believe in the Constitution. The Supreme Court has, uh, has given a very, very expansive reading of the Second Amendment so that it's almost impossible to regulate guns. I'm not going to take anybody's guns away as president. I, I will say this. We ought to be investigating the reason the, the school shootings in this country, the mass shootings are unacceptable. And we need to be investigating why they're happening in this country. Why are we alone? Um, why is that happening? This, why did it never happen before? Two of the culprits that ought to be investigated, and I'm not saying that we know this, but one is SSRIs, the, the widespread use of now of these, this class of psychiatric drugs that has a black box label on it saying may cause homicidal and suicidal uh, behavior. Um, and we now have a large part of the American population on those. The other is, you know, other issues like video games. NIH, the National Institute of Health, ought to be studying what are, why is it that Switzerland, which has comparable levels of guns, has not had a mass shooting in 21 years, and we have one every 21 hours. Why is that? That is, you know, when I was a kid, kids my age, or bringing their rifles to schools for shooting clubs. Nobody ever blinked at that. Nobody ever started shooting at other children in the schools. It just did never happen before. This is unique in, in human history, and we need to be studying that. Since 1996, NIH has had a policy not to study the etiology or the origins of gun violence, and I'm gonna change that. As, as just a final question, are you staying off the issue of vaccination and all the controversial issues, vaccination, 5G telecoms causing brain cancer now as you go? No, I, I talk about those issues with anybody who wants to. They're not issues that I lead with. But as you know, I won a case on the uh, dangers of, of Wi-Fi, of, of cell phone radiation. I won the F Federal Court of Appeals, the United States uh, Circuit Court forcing FCC to go back for uh, rebuking them for lying to the American public about claims that uh, cell phone radiation was safe at the levels currently regulated. There's other states that are now banning them. In terms of vaccines, I'm happy to talk about anything anybody wants to talk about, but it's not something that I'm lead. That is one of the, my major campaign issues. Well, Mr. Kennedy, thank you for giving up time at a busy phase in your life, and I hope you'll give me some more time because there's so much to discuss with you. I look forward to it, I hope. Thank you, Riz. I enjoyed our conversation. Thank you, sir. Thank you to all my guests, Rick Wilson, Mark Lotter, and Robert F. Kennedy, Jr. We'll take a look at Joe Biden's Democratic campaign and bring you more engaging conversations from the U.S. elections, as well as a broad range of important global issues in upcoming episodes of The Riz Khan Show. I'll see you then. From me and the team here in Washington, D.C., thanks for watching. Seeing the Tucson sector, obviously there's not hundreds of people crossing over, but you see the structural issues here. Uh, what do you think being here seven months later from your first trip? What's I changed mean, or what's gotten better? I, yeah, I mean, I don't think anything has changed. I think it's getting worse and worse. This county has a series of different problems than, than Yuma did. Um, but it's all the same. It's, it's the infrastructure has been torn up or not completed, and that is deliberate and shockingly petty. Um, the personnel are demoralized, and they've been told to stand down, and that also is shocking. And, and most importantly, we have policies that could prevent this literally overnight. If the Border Patrol were allowed to do its job, if they had not been instructed to stand down, 90% uh, of this problem could end overnight. And our country, this is an existential threat to our country. 
and um, it's been politicized, and it's being politicized now by both sides on Capitol Hill. I, I blame the Democrats much more. But, you know, the Republicans put a good put in a clean bill, and, uh, and that's what they ought to do, and not, you know, think about politics, but how do we solve this problem? How do we solve it today? You mentioned a clean bill, kind of alluding to the Senate bill being one that's not necessarily clear cut. I know you probably haven't gone through the entire border bill that the Senate's proposing. What are your initial thoughts, though, just kind of in conversation? Obviously, you know enough about it. What are your initial thoughts? You're saying Republicans should put forward a clean bill instead. Uh, I mean, I think that they ought to listen to the simple suggestions that are coming from the Border Patrol and from local law enforcement. And, you know, we talked to the sheriffs today and the Border Patrol are, are, looks like they're going to oppose the bill because it doesn't change anything. And it's very clear what needs to be done. Um, but, uh, and it's very, very strange that it's demoralizing and disheartening that the political system is so broken that you can't get, you know, that we can't just get a clean bill that says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to complete the infrastructure. We're going to start enforcing the laws that forbid people from coming across. Um, and we're going to send anybody, everybody back. If you want to get asylum in this country, you come through a legal port. You don't come across illegally. Now, how confident would you be in the presidency to be able to get legislation across? Right now, Congress I, I is in gridlock. I don't need legislation. If, I were, if President Biden wanted to stop this, he could stop it overnight. He could complete this fence. Um, I'm not going to need legislation. I'm going to do this by executive order, and I'm going to do it on day one. Now, when it comes to Chinese nationals, we've seen a massive surge. They're one of our gross popu biggest growing populations across the southern border right now, hundreds percent increase over what we've seen in the past. Now, I've asked Customs and Border Protection, despite what Christopher Ray, our FBI director, has said, that they're our greatest national security risk. They are not designated as a special interest country because of politics. Would that change under your administration? Would you do something differently with the Chinese migrants coming across? Well, I, I would stop all migrants from coming across. Uh, but, you know, when the night that I was in Yuma, we saw the, probably the biggest single group that was coming across after the Africans were Chinese nationals. And I think, you know, this is something that, you know, there are people coming from many, many countries of interest. There are people coming from Azerbaijan, from Tajikistan, and uh, Afghanistan, and, you know, other places that, that none of this should be happening. So, you know, we shouldn't even be having to decide which, which ethnic group or which national group gets across. Everybody should be stopped from getting across unless they want to come in legally. Final question here. Uh, we have reports from the Darien Gap, from CBP, from DHS, saying that they know they interviewed 300 people, not one, claim fear of persecution, all the way down in the Darien Gap. What would you do differently? You've talked about these people don't qualify for asylum. So what would be different with the asylum I, I process? I would stop. I would make an announcement on day one that it's over. And I would then begin enforcing the law so nobody gets across. And I would also start talking to the, the presidents of the Central American countries of Ecuador, Colombia, and, uh, and enlist their help in, in solving this problem internationally. Would you be willing to stop buying Venezuelan oil oh, because well, of all I, the, all the I, crisis that's happened? I mean, we have more Venezuelans than we do. Yeah, Mexican I don't know if that's going to solve the problem. I, I, you know, the problem we can solve right here at the border. We don't even have to go down to the Darien Gap. I am going to look into the United Nations role in encouraging Chinese to come over here and encouraging the, um, is the, uh, the caravans to come up and supporting the caravans. I don't think that that's uh, a good use of U.S. or other multinational money.